The Commission and Audit is the third constitutional commission as provided for by the 1987 Constitution. It is the Philippines' Supreme State Audit Institution. The Philippine Constitution declares its independence as the Constitutional Office grants it powers to audit all accounts pertaining to all government revenues and expenditures or uses of government resources and to prescribe accounting and auditing rules, gives it exclusively authority to define the scope and techniques for its audits, and prohibits the legislation of any law which would limit its audit coverage. Article 9D Section 1 of the Constitution provides for the composition of Commission on Audit and the qualification of its commissioners. The Commission on Audit shall be composed of a chairman and two commissioners. They shall be natural-born citizens of the Philippines, and at the time of their appointment, at least 35 years of age, certified public accountants with not less than 10 years of auditing experience, or members of the Philippines Bar who have been engaged in the practice of law for at least 10 years and must not have been candidates for any elective position in the elections immediately preceding their appointment. At no time shall all members of the commission belong to the same profession. Currently, the commission and audit is being headed by Chairperson Michael G. Aguinaldo, together with Commissioner Roland Pondock. Their terms shall end on February 2, 2022 and February 2, 2025, respectively. On appointment, the chairman and the commissioner shall be appointed by the president with the consent of the Commission on Appointments for a term of seven years without reappointment. On term or prohibition of those first appointed, the chairman shall hold office for seven years, one commissioner for five years and the other commissioner for three years without reappointment. Appointment to any vacancy shall be only for the unexpired portion of the term of the predecessor. On reappointment, prohibition against the reappointment applies not only to the commissioner appointed for nine years but also to those appointed for a shorter period because the reason underlying the prohibition is equal applicable to them. The prohibition being, according to this theory, intended to prevent the commissioners from being exposed to improper influences that are up to be brought to bear upon those aspiring for reappointment. So, we now go to this topic's related cases. Our first case is Nationalista versus Bautista. In this case, the appointment of the respondent Felix Angelo Bautista is unconstitutional since he was still the Solicitor General while being appointed as a member of the COMELEC. It was emphasized that Commission on Elections or any other constitutional commissions must be independent. Second case is Brillantis vs. Urak. The appointment of the respondent's associate commissioner, Haide Urak, as acting chairman of the COMELEC by the President of the Philippines was challenged by the petitioners since it was stated in Section 1 of Article 9A of the 1987 Philippine Constitution that the constitutional commissions, which shall be independent, are the Civil Service Commission, the Commission on Elections, and the Commission on Audit. It was ruled out as unconstitutional and that although essentially constitutional commissions are executive in nature, they are not under the control of the President of the Philippines in the discharge of their respective functions. Next case is NP versus Vera. It was maintained that the prohibition against the reappointment applies not only to the commissioner appointed for nine years, but also to those appointed for a shorter period, 
because the reason underlying the prohibition is equally applicable to them. The prohibition being, according to this theory, intended to prevent the commissioners from being exposed to improper influences that are up to be brought to bear upon those aspiring for reappointment. In the case of Republic versus Imperial, the question raised was on the expiration of term. It stated that the Constitution is clear that the chairman and the commissioners shall be appointed by the president with the consent of the commission on appointments for a term of seven years without reappointment. Of those first appointed, the chairman shall hold office for seven years, one commissioner for five years, and the other commissioner for three years without reappointment. Appointment to any vacancy shall be only for the unexpired portion of the term of the predecessor. In no case shall any member be appointed or designated in a temporary or acting capacity. In Demanded versus Commission and Audit, the case this falls under the common provision of Section 1, Paragraph 2 of Article 9D that states that the chairman and the commissioner shall be appointed by the president with the consent of the commission on appointments for a term of seven years without reappointment. Of those first appointed, the chairman shall hold office for seven years, one commissioner for five years, and the other commissioner for three years without reappointment. Appointment to any vacancy shall be only for the unexpired portion of the term of the predecessor. In no case shall any member be appointed or designated in a temporary or acting capacity. And lastly, the case of FUNA versus Chairman. It was ruled that the commissioner who resigns after serving in the commission for less than seven years is eligible for an appointment to the position of chairman for the unexpired portion of the term of the departing chairman. Such appointment is not covered by the ban on reappointment, provided that the aggregate period of the length of service as a commissioner and the unexpired period of the term of the predecessor will not exceed seven years and provided further that the vacancy in the position of chairman resulted from death, resignation, disability, or removal by impeachment. Reappointment found in Section 1, Paragraph 2, Article 9D means a movement to one and the same office, commissioner to commissioner or chairman to chairman. Article 9A, Section 4. The Constitutional Commission shall appoint their officials and employees in accordance with law. Article 9A, Section 3. The salary of the chairman and the commissioner shall be fixed by law and shall not be decreased during their tenure. Article 9A, Section 2. No member of a Constitutional Commission shall during his tenure hold any other office or employment. Neither shall he engage in the practice of any profession or in the active management or control of any business which in any way may be affected by the function of his office, nor shall he be financially interested, directly or indirectly, in any contract with or in any franchise or privilege granted by the government, and of its subdivisions, agencies, or instrumentalities including government-owned or controlled corporation or their subsidiaries. Article 9D, Section 2, Paragraph 1A. The Commission on Audit shall have the power, authority, and duty to examine, audit, and settle all accounts pertaining to the revenue and receipts of and expenditures of use of vans and property owned or held in trust by or pertaining to the government or any of its subdivisions, agencies, or instrumentalities, including government-owned or controlled corporation with original charters. On impeachment, Article 11, Section 2, together with the President and Vice President, the members of the Constitutional Commissions and the Ombudsman may be removed from office on impeachment for and conviction of culpable violation of the Constitution, treason, bribery, graft and corruption, other high crimes, or betrayal of public trust. 
all other public officers and employees may be removed from office as provided by law but not by impeachment. On appeal, under Rule 64, Section 2, 1997 Rules of Civil Procedure, a judgment or final order of the Commission and Audit may be brought by an aggrieved party to this court on certiorari under Rule 65. On Fiscal Autonomy, Paragraph 1A of Section 2 of Article 9B provides at that Commission and Audit shall have the power, authority, and duty to examine, audit, and settle all accounts pertaining to the revenue and receipts of the expenditures or uses of funds and property owned or held in trust by or pertaining to the government or any of its subdivision, agencies, or instrumentalities, including government-owned or controlled corporation with original charters and on a post-audit basis. A. Constitutional bodies, commissions, and offices that have been granted fiscal autonomy under this constitution. Finally, now that the three constitutional commissions have been discussed, at this point, we shall now have the amending process of the constitution. How is the constitution changed, and what will be its basis? The amending process is enshrined under Section 1, Article 2 of the 1987 Constitution. When we say amendment, we define it as one that envisages an alteration of one or few specific and separable provisions, but it does not substantially alter the basic setup or framework of the government. In other words, it is not the amount of the changes but the quality of the changes, meaning it only intends to improve specific parts or to add new provisions deemed necessary to meet new conditions or to suppress specific portions that may have become obsolete. Amendment is different with revision, as the latter means that the entire document is being re-examined to determine how and to what extent these provisions should be altered. First is by Congress. It is submitted that each House may formulate amendments by a vote of three-fourths of all its members, and then pass it on the other House for a similar procedure. In case of disagreements, it shall be settled through a conference committee. Second is by Constitutional Convention. Should a proposal be made by a Constitutional Convention, the Convention, once organized, will be free to decide the vote required to carry the proposal. In most cases, only a majority is required. Whether the amendatory process will be done through Congress or through a constitutional convention is a matter for Congress to decide. Third is by people through initiative. It is the power of the electorate to approve or reject legislation through an election called for the purpose. There are two modes, thus, a referendum on statutes which refers to a petition to approve or reject an act of law or part thereof passed by Congress, and b. Referendum on local law, which refers to a petition to approve or reject a law, resolution or ordinance enacted by regional assemblies and local legislative bodies. There are three ways to propose for amendment or revision. First is by Congress. This is enshrined in Article 17 Section 1 of the Constitution. The power to amend the Constitution or to propose amendment thereto is not included in the general grant of legislative powers to Congress, Section 1, Article 6, Constitution. It is part of the inherent power of the people. As the repository of sovereignty in a republican state such as ours, Section 1, Article 2, to make and hence to amend their own fundamental law, Gonzalez v. Kamalek. Congress may propose amendments to the Constitution merely because the same explicitly grants such power. Thus, when exercising the same, it is said that senators and members of the House of Representatives act not as members of Congress but as component mem elements of a Constitution Assembly. When acting as such, the members of Congress derive their authority from the Constitution, unlike the people, when performing the same function, for their authority does not emanate from the Constitution. They are very source of all powers of government, including the Constitution itself. Second is by Constitutional Convention. 
This is provided for by Article 17, Section 3 of the Constitution. Congress, acting as a constituent assembly, has a full and plenary authority to propose constitutional amendment or to call a constitutional convention for the purpose. The grant to Congress as a constituent assembly of such plenary authority to call a constitutional convention includes all other powers essential to the effective exercise of the principal power granted. While the authority to call a constitutional convention is vested by the Constitution solely and exclusively in Congress acting as a constituent assembly, the power to enact the implementing details such as the Republic Act 6132 does not exclusively pertain to Congress acting as a constituent assembly. Such implementing details are matters within the competence of Congress in the exercise of its comprehensive legislative power, which power encompasses all matters not expressly or by necessary implication withdrawn or removed by the Constitution from the ambit of legislative action. When Congress acting as a constituent assembly omits to provide for such implementing details after calling a constitutional convention, Congress acting as a legislative body can enact the necessary implementing legislation to fill in the gaps. In the case of Imbong v. Comelec, the Supreme Court sustains the constitutionality of the enactment of Republic Act 6131 by Congress acting as a legislative body in the exercise of its broad lawmaking authority and not as a constituent assembly. Third and last is by people through initiative. This is provided in Article 17, Article Section 2 of the Constitution. Now, we will go to Republic Act No. 6735, the Initiative and Referendum Act. According to Professor Joaquin Bernas in his book, Without Implementing Legislation, Section 2 of Article 17 of the Constitution cannot operate, since it is said to be not self-executory. Republic Act 6735 was enacted. Initiative under this act is the power of the people to propose amendments to the Constitution or to propose and enact legislations through an election called for the purpose. It is method whereby the people themselves can directly propose amendments to the Constitution. This act seeks to operationalize the mandate provided by the Constitution that the people are empowered to directly propose, enact, approve, or reject in whole or in part any law or constitutional amendment through the process of initiative and referendum. There are three ways of initiative to wit. First, initiative on the constitution which allows for a petition proposing amendments to the constitution. Second, initiative on statutes which allows proposals for enactment of a national legislation. Third, initiative on local legislation which covers ordinances and the resolutions in the regional down to the barangay level. So, we have two questions regarding people's initiative. First is how can one start a people's initiative? Registered voters are allowed to participate in an initiative and referendum. For national legislations, at least 10% of the total registered voters in the Philippines should sign the petition for a new law. It also requires the signature of at least 3% of registered voters in each legislative district. The Commission on Elections, COMELEC will verify signatures collected once the required number is reached. Signatures collected should not just be real, but should also belong to registered voters. The commission must verify and check the signatures against the list of voters used in the latest elections held. Once the petition is determined to be sufficient, the COMELEC shall publish it at least twice in newspapers for the public to see and understand. The Commonwealth shall also determine the date of the national referendum, which should be held 
not earlier than 45 days but not later than 90 days once the petition is deemed sufficient. In 1996, where an attorney Jesus, as Delphin, filed with Comelec a petition to amend the Constitution to lift term limits of elective officials by people's initiative. The petition was included in the case of Santiago v. Comelec, wherein one of the issues settled was whether RA 6735 intended to include initiative on amendments to the Constitution, and if so, whether the Act, as worded, adequately covers such initiative. After going back to the interpolations made by the Constitutional Commission, the Court ruled that Section 2 of Article 17 is limited to proposals to amend, not to revise, and further that the proposed modified amendments thereto clearly show that it was a legislative act which must implement the exercise of the right. The court eventually stopped the Comelec from entertaining the petition and held that the Republic Act No. 6735 is incomplete, inadequate, or wanting in essential terms and conditions insofar as initiative on amendments to the Constitutional is concerned. The second attempt to amend the Constitution was made by the group of Raul El Lambino. In this case, the court discussed and laid down the requirements of people's initiative on the Constitution. It held that the Lambino group failed to comply with the basic requirements for conducting a people's initiative. The court held that the Comelec did not commit grave abuse of discretion on dismissing the Lambino petition. Thus, as decided, the initiative petition does not comply with Section 2, Article 17 of the Constitution on direct proposal by the people. Section 2, Article 17 of the Constitution allows a people's initiative to propose amendments to the Constitution stating, Amendments to the Constitution may be directly proposed by the people through initiative upon a petition. The essence of amendments directly proposed by the people through initiative upon a petition is that the entire proposal on its face is a petition by the people. This means two essential elements must be present. First, the people must author and sign the entire proposal. No agent or representative can sign on their behalf. And second, as an initiative upon a petition, the proposal must be embodied in a petition. The Lambino Group submitted a copy of the signature sheet before the Supreme Court. However, there is not a single word, phrase, or sentence of, the, of their group's proposed changes in the signature sheet. Neither does the signature sheet state that the text of the proposed changes is attached to it. The signature sheet merely asks a question to whether the people approve a shift from the bicameral presidential to the unicameral parliamentary system of government. It does not show to the people the draft of the proposed changes before they are asked to sign the signature sheet. Clearly, the signature sheet is not the petition that the framers of the Constitution envisioned when they formulated the initiative clause in Section 2, Article 17 of the Constitution. A signature requirement would be meaningless if the person supplying the signature has not first seen what it is that he or she is signing. Capizolo v. State Ballot Commission Second, the initiative violates Section 2, Article 7 of the Constitution, disallowing revision through initiatives. Where the initiative clause allows amendments but not revisions to the Constitution, courts have developed a two-part test, A. Quantitative test and B. Qualitative test. The quantitative test asks whether the proposed change is so extensive in its provision as to change directly the substantial entirety of the Constitution by the deletion or alteration of numerous existing provisions. The qualitative test asks whether the change will accomplish such far-reaching changes in the nature of our basic governmental plan as to amount to revision. 
Under both tests, the Lombinus Group Initiative is a revision and not merely an amendment. Quantitatively, Lombinus Group proposed changes overhaul two articles, Article 6 and Article 7, affecting a total of 105 provisions in the entire Constitution. Qualitatively, the proposed changes alter substantially the basic plan of government from presidential to parliamentary and from a bicameral to a unicameral legislature. A change in the structure of government is a revision of the Constitution. Lambino Group's initiative is a revision and not an amendment. Therefore, the present initiative is void and unconstitutional because that violates Section 2, Article 17 of the Constitution limiting the scope of a people's initiative to amendments to this constitution. The framers of the constitution intended a clear distinction between amendment and revision. It is intended that the third mode of stated in section 2 article 17 of the constitution may propose only amendments to the constitution. Merging of the legislative and the executive is a radical change, therefore constitutes a revision Article 17 of the Constitution provides. In addition, citing American jurisprudence, Justice Antonio Carpio in his Ponencia said, Revision broadly implies a change that alters a basic principle in the Constitution, like altering the principle of separation of powers or the system of checks and balances. There is also revision if the change alters the substantial entirely of the Constitution, as when the change affects substantial provisions of the Constitution. On the other hand, amendment boldly refers to a change that adds, reduces, or deletes without altering the basic principle involved. Revision generally affects several provisions of the Constitution while well, amendment generally affects only the specific provision being amended. At this point, we shall now go to ratification. It is defined as an awkward process of ratifying something, such as treaty or amendment. The process of ratification is provided for by Article 17, Section 4 of our Constitution. Relating it in our present constitution, our 1987 constitution was approved by the 1986 Constitutional Commission on October 12, 1986. It was presented to President Corazon C. Aquino on October 15, 1986. It was ratified on February 2, 1987 by a plebiscite. In the case of Tolentino v. Comelec, the Organic Resolution No. 1 of the Constitutional Convention of 1971, insofar as it provides for the holding of a plebiscite on November 8, 1971, as well as the resolution of the Comelec complying therewith, are declared by the Supreme Court to be null and void. In order that a plebiscite for the ratification of an amendment to the Constitution may be validly held, it must provide the voter not only sufficient time but ample basis for an intelligent appraisal of the nature of the amendment per se as well as its relation to the other parts of the constitution with which it has to form a harmonious whole. The Supreme Court is of the opinion that the present constitution does not contemplate in Article 15, Section 1 as plebiscite or election wherein the people are in the dark as to frame of reference they can base their judgment on. Theories regarding the position of a constitutional convention in our system of government It has always been established that a constitutional convention is considered to be separate from the other branches of the government that it is supposed to be a creation as authorized by law calling is just for the purpose of amending or revising the constitution. The people themselves have already decided in constitutional convention assembled to limit themselves and future generation in the exercise of the sovereign power which they would otherwise possess 
and it is exactly such limitation that enables those subjects to governmental authority to appeal from the people who is drunk to the people's sober, especially in times of excitement and hysteria. The constitution should be the protector of the people against injury by the people. The process of judicial review is provided for by Article 8, Section 1 of the Constitution. Generally, the action of the Constitutional Convention that is subject to judicial review would only be on the procedural matter, as the substantial matter involved in the amendment or revision as proposed. The Constitutional Convention's discharge would be beyond review. In the case of Sanidad v. Comelec, the Supreme Court disagreed with the contention of the Solicitor General that the question at bar is political in nature. The amending process, both as the proposal and ratification, raises a judicial question. Political questions are neatly associated with the wisdom of the legality of a particular act, where the vortex of the controversy refers to the legality or validity of the contested act. That matter is definitely justiciable or non-political. In Mabanag v. Lofis Vito, the court declined to pass upon the question whether or not the given number of votes cast in Congress in favor of a proposed amendment to the Constitution satisfied the three-fourth vote requirements of the fundamental law, characterizing the issue as political one. In the case of Mamerto v. Kamalak, Initiative has been described as an instrument of direct democracy whereby the citizens directly propose laws. As it is the citizens themselves who legislate the laws. Direct legislation through initiative along with referendum is considered as an exercise of original legislative power as opposed to that of derivative legislative power which has been delegated by the sovereign people to legislative bodies such as the Congress. In the case of Gonzalez v. Comelec, the court settled the following matters. Power of the court to review the exercise of this power by the Congress. In short, the issue whether or not a resolution of Congress acting as a constituent assembly violates the Constitution is essentially justiciable, not political, and hence subject to judicial review, and to the extent that this view may be inconsistent with the stand taken in Mabanyag v. Lopez Vito, the latter should be deemed modified accordingly. The members of the court are unanimous on this point. The Congress cannot through ordinary legislative process have the power to amend a proposed amendment to the Constitution. Remember, the power to amend the Constitution or to propose amendments thereto is not included in the general grant of legislative powers to Congress. It is part of the inherent power of the people, as the repository of sovereignty in a republican state such as ours to make and hence to amend their own fundamental law. Congress may propose amendments to the Constitution merely because the same explicitly grants such power. Hence, when exercising the same, it is said that senators and members of the House of Representatives act not as members of Congress but as component elements of a constituent assembly. When acting as such, the member of Congress derive their authority from the Constitution. Unlike the people, when performing the same function for their authority does not emanate from the Constitution, their very source of all powers of government, including the Constitution itself. Ratification of the Constitution may be held simultaneously in a general election. There is in this provision nothing to indicate that the election therein referred to is a special, not a general election. The circumstance that amendments to the Constitution had been submitted to the people for ratification in special election merely shows that Congress deemed it best to do so under the circumstances then obtaining. It does not negate its authority to submit proposed amendments for ratification in general elections. In Tolentino v. Comelec, the courts may review the validity of an act of the Constitutional Convention proposing a particular amendment to the Constitution. There should be no more doubt regarding the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court. The constitutionality of the acts of Congress acting as a constituent assembly 
and for that matter, those of the Constitutional Convention called for the purpose of proposing amendments to the Constitution which considerably is at par with the former. Before we come to the end of our report, we would like to share a few insights on the topics discussed. Number 1. It takes time for the people to fully appreciate the power of initiative and referendum. Two attempts have been made, yet no amendment proposed has yet to find its way to success. Number 2. One of the constraints for the effective invocation of the people's initiative and referendum is the financial requirements to start the process, especially in gathering the required signatures. It will take a big amount of resources to launch such initiative. And number three, inasmuch as the process of initiative and referendum is an exercise of an extraordinary power of the people, the law that seeks to operationalize, it must be complete and ambiguous to avoid constitutional challenge. Careful scrutiny of compliance with constitutional and legal requirements is needed initiating any amending process, as any defect in the procedure not followed can lead to the invalidation of the whole process. And lastly, as held by the court in Lambino v. Comelec, the Constitution as the fundamental law of the land deserve the utmost respect and obedience of all the citizens of this nation. No one can trivialize the Constitution by carefully amending or revising it in blatant violation of the clearly specified modes of amendments and revision laid down in the Constitution itself. Thank you.